Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Rosen, VP of AHIMA International. Thank you so much for joining the Open Air Roundtable today. In the many years that I've worked in this sector, interoperability has been a constant big theme. Some of the brightest minds that I know have worked on solving this, but I must admit that it was not until I came across Open Air that I really thought to myself, here we have something that could really seriously be a game changer when it comes to cracking the interoperability code. Living myself in Barcelona, it's been exciting to see how the Catalan Ministry of Health has embraced open air standards. And you'll hear much more about this in the round table as we have the pleasure of having with us one of the most senior government officials in charge of this transformation. All in all, I can assure you that today we have not only some of the brightest minds in general, but certainly the global leaders when it comes to open air. At AHIMA, we believe that the key to healthcare transformation lies in the healthcare information, lies in the health information, the health data. One of the greatest global challenges really lies in breaking down these data silos. I truly believe that we have a, a golden opportunity with open air standards to really transform healthcare as we know it by having access and using data in a whole new way. So once again, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, both to our distinguished panelists and certainly also to all of you who are here with us. I'm sure you will enjoy the discussion and we look forward to your comments and questions along the way. And now I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed moderator of our discussion today, Dr. Abdulela Al Hassawi. Dr. Al Hassawi is the former founding director general of the Saudi Patient Safety Center and a health advisor on patient safety for the Saudi Arabian Ministry of Health. He led the efforts to establishing the first Saudi Patient Safety Center as a WHO collaborating center for patient safety policies and strategies. Worth mentioning, one of only five WHO collaborating centers worldwide in this field. Dr. Al Hassawi holds both American and Canadian certified boards of general surgery with subspecialty in transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. Dr. Al Hassawi is a consultant to several national and international quality and safety organizations. And recently, he became a board member and vice president of the Global Sepsis Alliance, as well as an advisor to AHIMA International. He was part of the expert panel on the third Global Patient Safety Challenge of the WHO and chaired the organizing committee for the fourth Global Ministerial Summit on patient safety in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in 2019. Dr. Al Hassawi has introduced patient safety as a G20 priority in Saudi Arabia last year and is currently part of the WHO's Global Patient Safety Plan Task Force. I want to welcome Dr. Al Hassawi, who's here with us, and thank you so much to everyone who's joined. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, so, yeah. fantastic. So, uh, it is my pleasure actually to be moderating this uh, very important topic uh, here in, 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 in the region for, for the first time. So before I start uh, inviting the, uh, the esteemed uh, panel, I'm going to actually share with you uh, a quote that I just put in on, on my Twitter account in kind of preparation for, for this uh, uh, roundtable. So it's a quote by E.O. Wilson, and he says, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. So I think this very much uh, is at the heart of what we're gonna be discussing this evening. 
So it is my pleasure to start uh, introducing uh, our panel, starting with uh, Dr. Ahmed Belkhair. Dr. Ahmed Belkhair is currently the advisor for the digital transformation and the advanced technology at the Ministry of Health. He's a pediatrician and holds a master degree in health informatics. He's a thought leader in e-health domain, not just in Saudi, but in the region, combining the skills and knowledge of clinical and business side along with technical expertise and know-how in his current role at the health sector level and on the previous role at the Deputy Minister, as a Deputy Minister of eHealth at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Belkhair was responsible for the strategy and the delivery of the digital health transformation in support of the Kingdom's 2030 vision and objectives. The eHealth Initiative has over 150 programs and projects that include the automation and transformation of 20 accountable care organizations in the Kingdom, uh, spreading more than 280 hospitals and their related 2,300 primary care centers. He's also the chair of the uh, Information Health Exchange Saudi Arabia and a board member of the IHE International since 2013. So, uh, Dr. Belkhair, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Adil. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So our next esteemed panelist is Mr. Paul Perez Sust. He was born in Barcelona. Paul Perez has a degree in biology from the University of Barcelona and a master's degree in health economics and health management from the University of Barcelona and the Pompeo Fabra University. In July 2019, he was appointed as the IT Systems Director for the Survey Catala, the, and ex excuse me for, 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 for the pronunciation, at the Survey Catala Dala Salo, a position he currently holds together with the position of IT General Coordinator of the Catalonian Health Department. From 2014 to 2016, Paul has held various responsible positions with the Department of Salo and, and the Institute Catala, including Manager of IT Systems, Planning Director, and other high-level positions in Catalan. Mr. Paul. Nice to have you with us. Uh, and uh, the third uh, panelist is Dr. Hannah uh, Pohonian from Finland. She is an e-health management consultant at her own consultancy company, uh, Rosaldo Oi. She has worked in 31 different countries in Europe, North America, Middle East, and Asia. Her focus is on big regional and national healthcare IT e-health projects, uh, where data sharing across various systems, organizations, and even country borders is essential. She has provided consultancy about healthcare information systems and IT architectures, vendor neutral archiving, document base and structured data sharing, uh, shared workflow and open ecosystems. Besides consultancy, Hannah is also visiting a lecturer in Tallinn University of Technology. She's also worked in a university hospital in different positions and was responsible for e-health related financing under the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Finland. She's also represented Finland in the e-health area in the European Commission. So Hannah, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's a happy to be here. So uh, the next uh, panelist is Dr. Ian McNichol. He is a former Scottish uh, GP who has worked with Open Air for over 15 years and is a director, past co-chair of Open Air International. His fresh EHR consultancy clients include the health services of Sweden, Norway, Finland, Slovenia, Russia, England, Scotland, Malta, Jamaica, and Wales, and a number of commercial uh, organizations. He's an inter-open UK board member, honorary senior research associate at the University College London, and founding fellow of the UK Faculty of Clinical Informatics. So Dr. McNichol, Hi. it's a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, next is Dr. Samad Hassan. Uh, he's a co-founder and a vice chair of the Emirates Health Information Informatics Society, 
He serves as a health informatics specialist at Dubai Health Authority and to strategize and develop the digital health regulatory framework of Dubai. Uh, Dr. Hassan is also the co-founder and the coordinator of the GCC Task Force on Workforce Development in Digital Healthcare. He contributes to academia through his adjunct lecture role at Hamdan bin Mohammed Smart University. Uh, Dr. Hassan obtained a PhD in software engineering from the University of Leicester and a master in advanced computing from Imperial College in the UK. Dr. Hassan, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Mr. Thomas uh, Gornick. He's a company founder, CEO, and experience manager of Teams. Thomas has been building world-class software products for more than 30 years. He's also on the Open Air International Management Board and regularly speaks at conferences including Telemanagement Forum, HEMS, Health 2.0, Mobile World Congress, and Rewired. Thomas, it was it's nice and pleasure to have you with us. Hi, glad to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. So uh, basically, you know, uh, in 1950, the uh, medical data was expected to double in 50 years. And, you know, fast forward 70 years by 2020, do you know how long it would take for the doubling of the medical data? 73 days. So that's even beating Moore's law. Uh, which you know it, it it takes you know two two years for the doubling of of the of the computing speed, and no way that you know physicians or clinicians or anyone that works in the healthcare system would be able to manage this explosion of data, and 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 I believe that this would would continue to uh, be just enormous and and fast moving uh, moving forward. So while we're you know putting that in perspective of where we are. Uh, I'm going to start asking you some basically questions about this very important topic. So, you know, I think the very, the, um, I'm going to start with Ms. Uh, Hannah uh, first, and then I would ask her simply, <laughs> what is open air and or open EHR? So people, you know, uh, call uh, would understand what is, what is, what, what's, what's that and, and, and what it is about. So what is open air? Open air is a um, standard specification, specification for storing, managing, searching and exchanging social care and healthcare data. And uh, then you can utilize these specifications to make clinical models, archetypes, templates and software. And when all data are produced in a semantically coherent and open data model, then it means that they can understand each other's data and we can actually separate applications from data. So open air is vendor neutral, it is technology independent and uh, it's a very useful open standard. Okay, great. Uh, so Dr. Ahmed Belkhair, as, as, a, as a clinician and as an expert in this field, you know, giving the experience of clinicians and, 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 and physicians with, with electronic health records. Uh, you know, the question is why, why should we talk about open EHR? We should just go and buy one of those very expensive ones and then, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be good. So uh, what, what is it, what, what's, what, what's in it for the physicians and clinicians to be advocating for this topic? Okay, thank you, Trabella. You know, even if we go and buy one of the expensive products, actually, whatever we, we, we get among these, usually the requirements in the healthcare sector is usually changing and growing and, and becoming more and more. So you can see some of the, of the hospitals who are implementing an EMR after sometimes they do, they change it. And what's happening is uh, they, when, they, when they change, we, they, are, they are actually, their requirement is growing. So we need that HIR or that EMR to be uh, adaptive and uh, and growing with their needs. And um, 
And that, those changes, the most important critical things is the, the, the data and how they would like uh, to, to modify this, this, this component of what we are doing. And now the challenge becoming more when we are speaking about uh, uh, a national level, when the EHR, multiple health systems, multiple EMR systems will be communicating together. So those changes, when we are speaking about information exchange, the data model, when it's changed, it affects grossly those things. So what's, what's an open air differ from the EHR previously is that uh, it's, it's first, uh, the, the data elements is built by clinicians themselves. Uh, it is, it's uh, have a flexibility where you can add and change and modify. And the, 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 the modeling that you, we build uh, uh, through the open HR, uh, it's it built in a very exhaustive way. So whoever would like to utilize and use this model, which is a really ideal and it's community based, built by uh, everybody and it's open and free. Uh, it's inclusive to everything we are looking for. And it's easy to expand. And sometimes it's, it's free. So even if you would like to use some of those data elements within within each aspect of, of these data uh, 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 elements, uh, you can, for example, if you are taking a blood pressure, which is the most common example, uh, within the EMR, you will use, you will collect this blood pressure in many encounters in the ER, OBD, inpatient, ICU, everywhere. So in each place, you will collect maybe systolic, diastolic, you might have some more components, like if the patient is lying, if, if, if down, or if he's standing, or if, which machine I'm using, a manual machines or more. So the data elements in here are multiple. I will not use it all in all occasions, but it should be aligned. So if I would like to compare the blood pressure of this patient from all the data collected in that EMR, it should be all aligned. And if you think about this at the national level, you're gonna have more encounters than what we can imagine. So the most important points here is how this basic data elements that we built or the archetypes that what, which, which called here in open HR, is built in that exhaustive way. Everybody can utilize and use whatever you want. And it's open for any system that can, that would like to utilize this data to use or, uh, or remove any uh, data points uh, uh, in that. And it's also open for, for example, if a mobile app would like to connect to the, to the EHR uh, from, uh, it, it will be able to communicate with all the EMRs if all of them using the same uh, open air standard. So that's main things. And the coming now in the future is the artificial intelligence, where we would like really to be rich and have a similarity, a, univer a universal, I mean, data modeling, where, which everybody is using, uh, so that this AI will be, uh, will be enriched with this uh, data that we are collecting everywhere. Great. So, so uh, what I'm hearing is 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 a is a is a basically a more standardized uh, language that is uh, uh, you know friendly to 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 clinicians. So let me move to uh, to to uh, Mr. Paul Perez and ask him. You know, so how can we talk to decision makers and politicians about uh, you know? going towards open air and since you're 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 undergoing this uh uh implementation in catalonia i think you're you're the best person that you can tell us how you convince your politicians and decision makers uh on moving towards that you're you're on mute uh can can we unmute him Uh, we still we still ca can't hear you. Uh, so so and, and until the technical you know control room will 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 help us with with your uh, you know with with the, with with the sound system. Let me move to uh, Dr. McNichol. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, you know. Dr. Ahmed Belkhair mentioned AI, and again, the argument that we, we're, we're going to be having is, oh, Paul, can, so who's, uh, is that, is that, uh, is that Ian? Not me. Okay. 
So, so I'm, I'm going to continue. If, if the control would let me just, uh, you know, ask the next question to, to Dr. A. McNichol, and then I'll come back to, to Paul. Hopefully by that time it, 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 it would have been resolved. So Dr. Ahmed Bakhair mentioned AI, and, and the question is how AI would, 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 uh, would help us at a, at a national level or regional level with the current you know, uh, situation, let's say, of, of the electronic health records and, and having the, the, the different uh, stages of, of development of uh, EHR compared to how AI would, 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 uh, would be useful with open air. That's a very interesting question. So clearly AI is, is of the future, if not now, uh, but AI needs data. AI cannot work without data, and in particular, I think the experience of IBM Watson is that if you don't have pretty good data to start with, you just get lousy data out of the AI. That was one of the big messages. I think there's sometimes an assumption that if the data is big enough, then you know the AI can figure it all out and make sense of it all, and I think maybe that day will come, but we're a very long way from that. So in order to get the, the maximal potential out of current AI technologies and probably future for a long time, we need to be able to give those technologies very high quality information if we can. And right now, the complexity of health data and the fact that every single system describes a blood pressure potentially in a subtly different way, it doesn't understand the context. So the other thing is that you know, healthcare is extremely contextual. I often tell the story as a, you know, I was a family doctor. If I had a perfect open air system or otherwise big system, I need to be able to tell which blood pressures were recorded in an emergency room or maybe during, during anesthesia because these blood pressure results are going to mess up my hypertension targets because the patient has strange blood pressures. They may have lost a lot of blood or they may, the blood pressure may be very high because of anesthetic agents. So as we get better at pulling data together, we need more and more contextual information. And if we don't have that, the AI will, will simply fail and, and lead us uh, into wrong conclusions. And I think it's the, the IBM Watson story is a really good example of the perils of not doing this the right way. So if I'm, if I'm, a, if I'm a policymaker and uh, I'm, I'm basically... Uh, you know, investing in artificial intelligence. Uh, if I want to get the really the the, the meaningful use of of, of data, uh, I have to be advocating for open air. Can I put that? Well, word you need, yeah, you need to get the small data right. To get the big data right, you need to get the small data right. And small data is really challenging in health. It's very messy. It, it's very granular. Uh, you know, every specialty, subspecialty has its own has its own data needs. I think we have a world leading approach to understanding the complexity of that data, but then turning it into real software very quickly in a way that's not locked into any single proprietary solution. Great. So uh, uh, let's try again with with uh, Mr. Paul Perez. Uh, I don't know if if if. Uh, if the sound is, is, is working now. So we'll go back to the same question. Perfect. Yeah, we can, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Oh, you can, you can listen to me now? Okay, sorry for the technical problems with, uh, with my song. Okay, here in Catalonia, we have a, a, a very difficult reality with our uh, electronic health records in different hospitals because there are uh, very 27 hospital information systems, 27 different uh, with different EHR models. And we are trying to make a big change and uh, uh, to, to, to bet uh, to a unique uh, electronic health records. Okay, we are trying to use open EHR because for us is an the more the most important thing that is is an standard is oriented to the persistence of the data, and for us is very very important thing, and I think that we 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 can or we we could to to make the mobility of our professionals with open EHR uh, 
is a very important thing, but we have a unique meaning of the clinical concepts across all the systems. And for us, this is a, a big problem because sometimes I think that another colleague before commented this, but it's sometimes the, the information have the different meanings and our uh, now, our current uh, hospital information systems don't, don't, don't have an interoperability, a semantic interoperability. And we want to make this change. Uh, it's an important change for our country. They have a, uh, we have to, to arise this decision to the political makers. And it's very difficult to convince that to, to make this big change for the whole the hospitals in Catalonia and all the uh, primary health system. And we try to do it. We, we think that the, the, the benefits or, or the big benefits, it's, I think that this is the, the, the neutral vendor for, our, for us is important too. And I think that we take the full advantage to the clinical information. So, uh, so, so, so I think this is this is a, a sign that uh, uh, you know governments are getting the the message about the importance of of this topic. So let me move to Dr. Osama uh, uh, and ask him about uh, open air in the UAE. You know how how do you view it? Uh, how where do you see where do you see things are and what's the future? I think I, I, I'll try to get it from different perspective. So uh, trying to explain what's happening now in the market in the region. Uh, we're talking about any typical healthcare organization today, uh, especially after COVID, they realized that they, they just review their balance sheet for the last three or four years. They, they, they will discover that they spend a lot of money trying to put uh, building blocks, things like uh, high-end HIS, uh, high-end ERB, uh, CRM, or whatever. And they spend a lot of money on that. And especially after COVID, they realized that most of these investments, yes, they were good, but they were not agile enough. It was very difficult to do changes that were required during COVID. A lot of requirements are showering from the government, from patients. So things were changing very fast. And neither uh, those systems nor the, uh, I can say, the, the, the integrators or the, 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 the companies who are supporting these systems fail to act with this change. And even if you want to push this hard, that means that you need to have more investment to, to, to accelerate these changes. So everyone now understands that we need to separate the data layer from our infrastructures. And we need to have uh, technologies that can support that. And I believe that open air is one of very few technologies that can support any healthcare organization, with a small or big, public or private, to liberate the data from their EMR systems and expose them to either to AI or analytics. This is one side. Or even more interestingly is to develop some sort of like independent ABI framework, which allow them to do changes to develop new, can say business uh, modules, new uh, patient experience modules that can be developed, run, tested quickly without the burden of, of all those vendors. I think this is very important. Another side of that would be also, I think very important for all, even GCC countries, is to look into the, 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 uh, the possibility of developing open standards through open air for registries. Registries that can support research specifically, talking about cancer registries or other diseases. Those kind of uh, registries, we, we should not only focus on clinical data, but also onto social data. And, and this part, I can, uh, can ensure you that most of the current technologies or most of those systems which have ready information model will be would be very very rigid to absorb these kinds of requirements. So I think these two opportunities are very important and, and ready. It just need kind of sort of courage, sort of political power to to, to go into this path. And even more important is to have our own workforce who can really. 
uh, pick this technology and master it very quickly. And this is not easy task to do. Great. Right. So, so, so thank you very much. You're basically talking about separating the data from the uh, from the applications. Uh, so I'll, uh, let me go now to Thomas uh, Gornick, and I want to ask you, you know, the following question. Now, uh, from your experience in this field, uh, there are two ways to, to, to go for countries to uh, open air. One way is starting from scratch. So if you have, if you have a country that has not implemented uh, EHR, uh, you know, they're started in a, in a way starting with a clean slate maybe uh, a, a, you know relatively it could be uh, logistically and politically easier and then the other way is for countries that have used uh, EHR and, and and how to kind of go forward with that so how would you you know while you're answering this question uh, maybe talk about the the size of the of 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 of, of uh, the open air market, uh, you know, and then giving giving uh, also uh, you know touching on 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 the way that we can reach to to that common destination. Hopefully, that we're we're, we're aiming for. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so um, you're right. Uh, we are seeing two uh, two types of uh, of organizations adopt this. Uh, the, the green field, uh, which uh, has the advantage of starting from scratch, uh, they uh, have realized the, the importance of data and basically for them, uh, it's it's actually easiest. The, the, more, the, the other side of the spectrum is the more advanced countries uh, where we see that people have been collecting data for a long time, really good data. An example, of course, is, is Catalonia, but also the Nordics. We see uptake right in those places, especially because they've come across all the issues uh, with managing, uh, managing health data and ensuring the quality of that data. So in terms of vendors, uh, it's really interesting to see that uh, all the top vendors in the Nordics, uh, and I'm talking about top vendors for uh, HIS systems, for e EHR systems, obviously, uh, in Finland, Norway, and Sweden uh, have adopted open EHR. Now, uh, again, I think it's a sign of market maturity um, uh, and uh, it's really nice to see it was not a government mandated uh, uh, proposition. The vendors found uh, their own value and started building this. Uh, and of course, the customers, uh, in this case, the health system was very appreciative of the approach because uh, as I always say, I have never met a customer that would not like to have open data. They all want open data. No, no question about this. Nobody likes to be locked into a vendor's uh, data model. So the, the issue is basically where to start. And uh, as you said before, Greenfield is, is actually quite easy. Uh, but uh, what we do in installations where they already have an EHR, we go for the new stuff that this institution is building. COVID was a good example. COVID has really accelerated this, this trend. So we, uh, we place something which we call an innovation platform next to the existing legacy, start moving the data into this open format, but making sure that the new solutions next to the old ones, next to the legacy, are being built in a new way so that they don't recreate the same problems that we've had before. Now, obviously, there's a lot of legacy. And as we know from healthcare, it's not easy to replace. It's very sticky. Things move slowly. So this is a multi-year effort. But you can start today by building your next new app. And there's many in the backlog, I'm sure, in a new way so that with time, you're actually moving the data from the legacy, making this legacy easier to replace. But at the same time, you're setting up a completely new architecture, which doesn't have the same issues as the legacy had. Okay, thank you very much. So, so uh, uh, you know, two kind of uh, housekeeping uh, messages. One, uh, for the audience, uh, if you have any questions, there's a live poll icon at, at the bottom of your screen where you can actually put uh, the questions and you can put them to uh, open uh, or you can specify who, who the panelists that you want, you're, you're directing the question to. The other is we're going to start now with the first live poll. So we've, we've uh, come up with with number of polls for the audience just to kind of get a sense about uh, what your views are with uh, regarding open EHR. So at the bottom again of the of the screen, you will see a live poll. 
and uh, we will we will keep the live poll for for 15 20 seconds and then we'll show you the results so can we have the first uh, poll please so when did you hear about open ehr and then we have these different uh, answers and and it's it's uh, it's, it's going to go for a while until we have the 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 the, the final uh, results so there's a competition now between more than a year ago and never heard about it before and now we have uh, less than 3 months ago kind of uh, getting the second place but never heard about it before is is also a high percentage And as you can see, uh, maybe about one third is more than a year ago, and and then we have uh, the the others. So can you can we uh, stop? Uh, show us the final result of the of the live poll. So basically, uh, here we have it: thirty nine percent say that uh, more than a year ago, four percent say six to twelve months ago, seven percent of you say. Uh, three to six months, and 21% of you said less than three months, and 29, about a third of you said never heard about it before, which is a very good answer for me because uh, you're, 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 you're here for uh, hopefully to become one of the advocates and, and, and one of the supporters of this uh, important topic. So why don't we take another round of, of, of questions for, for, the, uh, for the audience? Uh, there was a question that we have. So I'm going to start with Dr. Ahmed Belkhair. There was a question to Saudi, uh, which is, what system is proposed for each clinical facility in Saudi to convert its data into standard form from the common data layer? Do you want me to repeat the question? Okay. Yeah, kindly. So what system is proposed for each clinical facility in Saudi to convert its data into a standard form from the common data layer? I don't know if that question is kind Aaron, of... Uh... Go ahead. I'm trying to explain some of the... Uh, no. we, your, your voice is cutting off. I think maybe you have a an, an connection uh, problem. Can you try again? I... Better now. Okay. We can we can we can hear you now. Uh, yeah, if you could if you could try again because we lost you. So uh, maybe we'll 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 move to another panelist as we're uh, kind of uh, getting Dr. Ahmed Belkhair back. So I'm going to I'm going to start uh, here with 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 Hannah. So so give us give us uh, you know again we we're, we're looking at this through the views of uh, important stakeholders. So we have clinicians, we have uh, uh, you know politicians and decision makers and we have patients. So maybe uh, how can you, you know, communicate the the the, uh, the usefulness of open EHR to to patients? And I think if we manage to get the, the the population to to see the value of that, then the population could also be advocating and putting pressures on on both clinicians and decision makers to move into that direction. In the Nordic countries, we have a very, very strong sharing culture. So in, in every single uh, country, we have had a nationwide document-based document uh, sharing infrastructure. And this means that the patients or citizens, they have given the informed decision that they allow professionals to view the data from the central platform. So the patients or citizens, they already see that it is of benefit. 
And now when we are moving to open air based uh, data sharing, for example, in Finland, we are putting up a national open air based uh, document uh, structured sharing. It is like um, it is that the patients or citizens, they know the benefits of data sharing already. And, and I think that what was very, very important was that we gave the access to the citizens to view their own data. So nothing is hidden from the patients. They see absolutely everything that the clinicians see as well. So, you know, everything is transparent. And, and I think that it is important when you, when you engage the, the patients. Okay, thank you very much. So, so let me now move to, uh, to uh, Dr. Ian McNichols. And, and uh, you know, can you talk about the open air uh, experience in, 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 in the UK? Uh, and, and where do you see that uh, moving forward? Yeah, so, you know, it, open air is an unusual technology. Uh, it's an unusual approach. It's, a lot of people find it very challenging, so it's, it's not surprising that it's taken some time to, to take hold. But possibly to follow on from what Hannah said, the place that I see it really making a difference is in continuity of care. We know that one of the big failings we have as clinicians is managing those transitions where patients go from one specialist to another, or in my case, from the general practitioner to the hospital. Uh, you know, if you think of something like a cancer pathway, there's a great number of specialties and professionals involved in that, all of whom have a different job to do. Trying to get good communications between them is very, very difficult. Tomaj and I were talking about this just yesterday, that right now, uh, with the closest analogy we can get is right now, think about the way that we, we share Word documents, let's say for a report. You know, we share the document, we put our name or a date on it, and we share it to someone else. You know how quickly those shared documents get out of synchronization and someone has to tidy it all up. The way we work in open air is a bit more like Google Docs, where everybody's working on the same data at the same time. We're not, we're not doing, as we'd say, in the, 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 the past the parcel. So the big, the, the big uh, things that are happening in the UK are largely around either national or regional shared re records, shared care records, to support continuity of care. And the nice thing is everybody's starting quite small, but starting in their, their own, you know, with a specific application, but they're all gonna start joining up. So just yesterday, we kicked off an end of life care plan project in part of England. Uh, in Scotland, they've already done some of that. So we'll pick up on the data models they've used there. We expect to use their data models directly, which saves us a ton of work. But we know there's another part of Scotland that is, is interested in the bigger project that we've done and we can share it back. In Wales, they're doing chemotherapy models. We'll use these as part of the same thing. In another part of England, we're doing um, cancer uh, MDT multidisciplinary team cares. Now, all of these data models we can share, all of that experience and indeed many of the apps that we build on top of these standard data stores we can share. And then of course it all becomes available for uh, analysis, for reporting and indeed for AI. So with the start of a journey where if you like, we've got little isolated pots of quite constrained work happening, but very, very quickly, these are all going to stump cat start to come together. Shared care, continuity of care with the patient at the center. And as Hannah says, able to see and to some, well, at a, a level it's safe for them to participate in their care, to record their own records and certainly see what we as clinicians are doing. That, that is definitely the future, but it has to be done in a properly managed way. We, we cannot break the medical legal rules about how we handle data. We do that in a safe and, uh, and sensible way. And that's what open air supports out of the box. I like to think it allows patients to come in as co-professionals and work inside our world. Uh, to the level at which they are comfortable and, and skilled. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Belkhair is back. And, uh, you know, if you could uh, maybe uh, uh, try again uh, with, with, with that question about converting yeah. data. Yeah, you know, you know the, uh, if I speak here about the kingdom, we have maybe uh, just few of the EMRs, two to three, maybe uh, using the open air 
as as a data model. We are using the regular their own proprietaries of, of the data. But when we are speaking about the national level, I remember in 2013 when we are starting to build our interoperability standards, we we think of um, uh, initially the, the one which was available the IHE. The open uh, the the fire was just starting. It was promising, but it wasn't yet having the enough number of use cases that we are looking for. So we did uh, maybe almost we spent two to three months just evaluating how we could uh, use, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues mentioned that we are, when we are in the information exchange, we are exchanging documents which contain some uh, data contents with either a specific data model similar to what we have in the, in FHIR or with, 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 with uh, templates or forms that we are looking Our can we, for example, use open air as a, as a data model to be exchanged using the IHE at that time? You know, the challenge, you know, currently, although we are, everybody is now moving to FHIR in the information exchange, but even in FHIR, the data model have some variation between countries. So if you go into the FHIR, uh, 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 the, the, the models that's used, for example, in US, and you go to other countries, you will find that they are uh, building a different uh, models with some some extensions of their own. They remove what they don't, they don't. They are not looking for, and they keep what they are looking for. Uh, and it, so that that uh, will 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 lose uh, the, the the universal uh, availability of uh, or the usage of the same uh, data model, which will be um, in the coming future uh, a very important source of the data uh, of data for the AI in that country. So. Uh, so that was a big challenge that even within the fire now that, that everybody is using, there are some variation between the extension use. So I think the open air uh, among the data that we are now collecting within our EMRs is maybe the best um, um, uh, method to be used, I mean, within the EMR, because soon if each of the facilities or government would like to utilize, for example, an, an algorithm from, from a country, they would like to have a real rich uh, data uh, with, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, a universal uh, data modeling that can be reused everywhere. So, so we spent two to three months analyzing, and our biggest challenge is which interoperability standards is uh, universally available and ready to market, and that's why we we use at that time uh, the the IHE. And now, as I mentioned, even if you are moving to fire, still this variation is not yet 100% solved with, with, the, with, the, with the data models within uh, fire. There are still some variations, and I think open air will be an excellent, an excellent uh, option that can help, help us really to be, uh, uh, to be having a really a universal standard in that moment. Thank you very much. So, so uh, maybe I'll go to, to Paul now. Uh, you know, whenever you uh, talk about money, uh, decision makers, you know, listen, you know, their, their, eye, their ears kind of perk up. So, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're implementing uh, one type of, of a vendor, uh, you know, EHR compared to if you're implementing uh, open EHR, uh, because some people would say, you know, why don't we just get one, uh, one, one vendor, maybe not that expensive vendor. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 so the question is, and I'm not putting you on the spot to give me a specific number, but then percentage wise, you know, roughly what, what, uh, because government will, will go into uh, an, a, a, an option that would be, you know, less costly you know, more cost effective and, and more usable in, in terms of, you know, data use. So how, how would you compare these to one vendor uh, EHR compared to open EHR? Uh, if I put one vendor, we don't have to take a vendor locking situation. For us, it's important to maintain the, the, the free to, to, to the vendors. And we don't have experience yet because we don't put open EHR, no? but we are expected, we suggested that we will savings 
around the saving the high cost of licenses that you don't have in a commercial product with electronic health records. I think that we will reduce the development time, improve the quality of the information. I think so that is one of the ROIs that using open EHR, we, we will find it. Improve that as analytics, uh, not uh, the, the unique model and implementation of clinical decision support tools and something like that, algorithm, machine learning, AI, etc. Improve to sustainability to healthcare systems and improve other code outcomes. And I think that uh, I, I insist of the, the thing that the, the semantic uh, interoperability that permits uh, open EHR increase the patient safety. Real, uh, I don't have a study the, the savings to use open EHR, respect another commercial uh, vendor or commercial uh, electronic health records. But the situation that we have, the neutral vendor, is uh, it's, it's a, a big approach for us and it's very interesting for us. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm actually going now with, with, a, with, a, with a quick question that was suggested by Dr. Uh, Osama. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you the question, you know, the relationship between open air and... Actually, this, uh, actually this question is to the expert in open air. <laughs> okay, so, so Dr. Osama is passing on to, let's say, Thomas, and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, ha we'll hear the, the views. So open EHR versus, uh, you know, FHIR, which is uh, fast healthcare interoperability resources. Yes. Yeah. So this question comes up a lot, and uh, the way the way I explain this difference is that the the H O seven world comes from uh, exchange of data, and we come from the persistence of data. So obviously there is uh, there's two ways to look at this. You have to look from the application down into the data, but we look from the data up into applications. So open EHR is a very stable data model. Uh, we mentioned before the blood pressure uh, was mentioned by Dr. Balker. That model has been the same for 20 years. Now, if you look at the HL7 world, in this time, we have had FIRE, which is now version four of HL7, basically. And it's really, really uh, a big problem if these technologies change every five years, because you would like to keep this data for the lifetime of the patient, which is 100 years. So now imagine how many times you will have to change the data with the changes that are brought by an exchange mechanism when you're really trying to persist data. So the bottom line is there is a big difference between a format that is designed for exchange and a format designed for persistence. The exchange format doesn't have to be as rich because you're usually not exchanging all the data, but the persistence format has to have the capability to store any clinical data in any care context. And this is what OpenHR does. Of course, we're fully aware that you need to exchange using Fire because the vendors, the big vendors are pushing this. I would argue that they are pushing this because they want to seem open and not really open up. Because if you would be open, then you would actually store the data in an open format as well. But they're not doing that. So what I would uh, like to finish with is that, of course, open AHR data can be easily converted into fire. Uh, we have servers that do exactly that. But for persistence, I think you need to take the full fidelity of data, everything you can get. And for this, you use open AHR. Thank you very much. So, so I'm I'm gonna ask a question, uh, and any one of you can can take it up. And I'm gonna be asking the question to, let's say, a generic vendor of an EHR who is staying here with us. Uh, let's assume that one of the vendors is 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 actually with us here in the round table. And the question is, uh, why are you viewed by? Uh, the open air community that you're uh, against this it sounds it sounds very uh positive and 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 it sounds very strategic and helpful for really uh meaningful use of data so what what would uh, if if you were to put your 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 your, your yourself in, in in their shoes what uh, how how would you be uh, thinking they would answer. And the, the, the reason is, uh, I'm, 
I'm, I'm thinking that we, we have to reach a, a common ground of, of, of uh, you know, it, we don't want to be in a situation of us against them because, you know, I think, as you say, you, 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 you can't find any country or any healthcare uh, provider, any professional who would not want to have full access and full meaningful use of, of the data. So how can we, you know, uh, you know how, how would they answer and how can we reach that common ground? Anyone? Yeah, okay. Ahmed? Okay, okay uh, yes, uh, doc, uh, what I believe, Doctor, uh, it's not always came from being, uh, having their own property and to close it. Actually, the investment that they have done and the, the size maybe of the system that they built. And uh, I think if, 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 uh, if those vendors think widely, if they are going to rebuild the, their EMR, they, they, it's better for them to use the open air because it will reduce the amount of effort and it will make them really more compatible to, the, to what's coming because this is a community base uh, built by community and I believe, uh, and it can be easily, I mean, expanded. It, it will be easily compatible to be connected with, uh, with through fire with, with other systems. So I believe that if they are building, uh, rebuilding their systems, that will be the best decision to, to, to make. Otherwise, they would like to reuse, for example, their previous investment that they have done in their, uh, in their databases and their current uh, models and the integration that they have done with many, maybe internal modules, multiple systems, because they, they, the AMR is a system of systems. It's too complex, too huge. And, and that's the, the main, I think, factor which uh, prevent them from moving uh, to open air directly. That's my, my, my real belief. Thank you very much. Well, why don't we ask, uh, I think we're going to give an opportunity for every one of you to answer. So, so Thomas wanted to answer, so I'll, 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 uh, you, can, yeah. you can take it. You have to also realize that the EHR is not the center of the healthcare universe anymore. So healthcare is actually moving out of hospitals into communities all the way to the home. So this really changes the game for these systems that are built for hospitals. That's that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is, in a lot of with a lot of the big vendors, it's a it's it's a business model issue. It's not so much a technology issue. So the fact that they have locked in the customers means they can stay there longer, and that's why it's really hard to disrupt. The largest vendors believe that they will be selling algorithms back to you based on your own data. And this is a very, very strong value proposition and business model for them. So they are actually fighting it. You can read about this in the US papers, how uh, the big vendors are saying, well, the patient doesn't really need the data. Uh, they're fighting against data blocking rules. It's really unbelievable to me. In Europe, we don't see this. Uh, in Europe, the hospitals rarely compete for patients and are willing to give the patients their data. In the US, it's a different story. And a lot of the big vendors are from the US. Okay. Any any other takers, uh, Dr. Osama, and then Hannah. I just want to take it from a different angle. So rather than asking vendors, we should ask hospitals and government uh, hospitals. Do you really want to have the ownership of your system? Do you, are you ready to pay the cost of that? Um, what I'm saying, the cost is not money. The cost is to leverage your workforce. Make sure that they are uh, are in the top of their game. They they got the right training. They got the right opportunities to exercise. So they need some sort of free free playground so they can do POCs, uh, try things. Even the courage to do these things sometimes is not there in our organization. Okay, Hannah. Can can we? Um yeah, go ahead. Okay, so many vendors also see open a differentiator. So, so for example, the Nordic vendors, um, most of them, they have already moved towards open air. So they are in the transition from legacy to open air based uh, functional modules. And then they see that, hey, we can, we can have this openness as a differentiator against these big legacy monoliths coming from the USA. And, and they also see that, hey, it's good that we have complementary add-ons. So we can work with other vendors, we can have niche module players uh, who have really great innovations and they can come to our ecosystem. And 
when I started as a open air ambassador of Finland, uh, it was uh, early 2020. Uh, in Finland, we had two open air based uh, software companies, and today we have 11 of them. So, you know, when the, the snowball <laughs> starts to move, then it comes bigger and bigger and bigger. And you have to have the right attitude and, and uh, as I said, culture. And then you can get people along and, and the vendors are listening to you and uh, listening to each other and, and they build partnerships and everybody is in the same open ecosystem. Uh, great, Ian. Can, can we unmute him please? Uh, apologies. Yeah, I mean, yeah. clearly this, this is quite a big change in the market. So we shouldn't expect it to all suddenly happen overnight, overnight. You know, big companies who've got a strong business model are not going to move. But I, I am increasingly pleased and surprised at companies further down the food chain. I mean, Tom, Tom has already talked about, you know, reasonably sized Nordic companies who've started to replatform on open air. But I see a lot of new entrants are, are attracted to this idea because very often their business model isn't about the data. So I had a fascinating conversation with a small company in the UK that are having to store data around, it's around mental health certification, you know, for, for patients who are mentally ill who have to be detained, which is very complex and very niche. And they're very proud of building a really good application experience. They're, they're storing their own data in their own system, but they, they don't really care. They, they really don't are not bothered about that. In fact, they understand that if they set their data inside a platform, they get access, they get access to meds and allergies around the patient. It saves them a lot of integration effort. So younger companies, smaller companies are starting to see this as, as a real benefit, not as, as a competitive thing. Uh, and in particular, companies who are ambitious and really see themselves as building into you know, a, a very substantial outfit with different customers around the world. They are really attracted to the flexibility of open air in terms of making use of existing data models, writing their own. But the key thing is being able to apply them to the smart data store, the, the thing we call the CDR, without any engineering. It makes it hugely attractive to them in terms of growing their stable of, of, of applications on top of this really agile data store, taking away all these data management headaches, versioning, audit, you name it, just the sheer complexity of health data is a very attractive offering for them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, so can we have the second uh, live poll for the audience now? Yes, uh, I think that the, the, the typical, the monolithic vendors that, that have the typical hospital information systems don't want to change because their business is it's, it's going well. They sell you a solution, a monolithic solution. You pay each year the licenses and something like that. But I think that it depends on us, it depends on the decision maker that wants to make the change. If we want to make the change, the vendors have to change after or before but it's the it's like the the same simile that the 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 snowball no like say before but i think that that this is the way for us because uh to to separate the data layer the the knowledge layer the clinical knowledge layer from the the technical layer is a is a big change for us because we could change the technical vendor and we persist the knowledge clinical in our data. And for us, is I think that it's the future. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, can I ask the, uh, the control room to, to give us a second poll? So uh, how long have you used electronic health records uh, at your healthcare facility? So this is a question to the audience. Uh, how long have you had uh, electronic health records, electronic medical records? So, it, it's going between, we don't have electronic medical records to more than three years, because uh, that just gives you an idea about, you know, the different phases of implementation of, of uh, EHR. 
you know, at different uh, places in, in, in the region. So let's give it another five seconds and then we, we, can, we can show the uh, results. There you go. So around one fifth of the audience say that we don't have HR EMR. And I know that in Saudi, uh, we actually uh, predominantly that there are more people that do not have EHR than the, the ones that do. Uh, and then we have also a, a big percentage of people that 88% uh, say more than thir three years. Uh, so, so again, that's uh, just to give an idea about uh, the, the the audience, and I think both uh, would be interested in that. You know, the, the more than three years because of uh, you know their experience and maybe not finding all the meaningful use of data, and then the others because you do want to move into an electronic, you know, uh, platform. But uh, I think rather than reinventing the wheel. Uh, I think that quick transition to open air would, would be uh, a good way forward. So uh, let's go into another round of, of, of uh, questions. And I, uh, again, I, I, I want to talk about the, uh, the data-driven decision-making in, in, in healthcare. So let me tell you, when I, when I talk about data-driven decision-making, as, as a clinician, uh, I hope that uh, all of you have seen Iron Man, so, uh, so I, as a clinician, I would love to, to have Jarvis, my own Jarvis, which would have access to, to the patient's past medical history, would have access to all the literature available that keeps doubling, you know, just keep in mind, this is, this, this is um, you know, beyond what we can comprehend. Every 73 days, the medical data, you know, double. So, uh, I want to have my AI, my Jarvis, getting access to the patient's data, to any other kind of information from wearable devices, to all the different sources of information, plus um, run that across the, the, the you know, the, the medical literature that is there and give me real time, uh, you know, right amount of information at the right time, in the right place, in the right format, so I can make a decision. And I, and I think that is, to me, that the, mo the most meaningful use of data. That's what I would call the data-driven decision-making. Now, this is a question for every one of you, just to, to get your thoughts. Uh, uh, is, that a, is that a science fiction or is that a science reality? And how far are we from, from that? So, you know, and, 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 you know I want to hear all your thoughts about that. If anyone wants to go first. First, I, I, don't, I don't think it is science fiction. I think I think to some extent we're here already, um, but I think there's almost two. There are almost two kinds of data here. I suspect what you were were really meaning was around, if you like, diagnostic data, data to support decision making. You know, what is wrong? What should I do next? But I think there's also that part which is around the, the coordination of care, making sure that things happen when they should, that people are doing the things they're supposed to be doing. So that's much more about process. Um, one of the areas that we're pushing into in open air is the idea of not just storing the data in a vendor neutral format and describing it like that, but also things like process and decision support. Um, you know, the business rules part of, of the, the health record, not just the data. But so we absolutely um, being able to base decision making on data, whether it's diagnostic or making sure the processes are happening properly. That, that's what we're trying to achieve. And, and let me just clarify, I, just, I, I want us to have Jarvis not just for physicians like me, but for, for a Jarvis for patients, a Jarvis for, for a decision maker, for a minister, you name it, the whole ecosystem. So, so and, 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 and Jarvis or whatever you want to call it, having access to all this amount of information that a human being cannot handle to give me the, the you know, to, to make it uh, more useful for me so I can make a decision real time. That, that's what I meant. So, so just think about this. Uh, we have been listening about decision support for, for many years and it's really not pervasive, right? And one of the reasons is that each time you build a decision support application, you spend more time than you're building the logic with how to integrate it with data. 
And, you know, I've done a lot of work with business rules, management systems and decision support systems. And really the most difficult thing rolling this out and scaling is that in each site, you have to adapt it to that application. And even in that configuration of that application, which makes it not scalable. So the advantage we have with OpenEHR is you actually build the decision logic based on the models. And then when people use the same models, this is actually um, uh, scalable across the healthcare sector. So we can't solve the issue of uh, how do we get the clinical knowledge read and uh, into the rules with OpenEHR, but we can make the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the software that you build applicable at all the website, uh, oh, sorry, all the, uh, the, the care sites that use the same models. And I think that's a big, big improvement. Okay. Any other takers? Uh, Rosana? So I think this is a classical question. We've been asked this question for so many years. I think that the, the question itself is, is a bit not correct. I believe whatever we do with regard to AI or technologies around decision support, it will never, never replace the, the cognitive power of a smart doctor who knows what's, who can even like uh, with, with one blink of an eye, he can understand what's happening with a patient. It's, it could be something very small that I don't believe that any decision support can make. But I believe that some specialties are more amenable to decision support. So we cannot compare, for example, dermatology with gastroenterology, for example. So I think we will have a long journey for those specific uh, specialties that needs more cognitive power from, from the physicians. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you're talking about IA rather than AI, which is intelligence augmentation. And I believe AI would help us with IA. So it's not either or. We're not uh, you know, getting rid of uh, human beings versus the machine. I think we can have a very good a uh, sweet spot where human beings do what they do best and the machine does what it does best. And a human being cannot handle, you know, these uh, huge amounts of data that keeps changing. So, so this is where you can need the, the, the AI to help you, but then make use uh, of, of, the, of the human beings to do their best. Uh, Hannah wanted to, to comment. Uh, I saw I just wanted to emphasize that one of the reasons why Finland is so much for open air is that we want to do uh, cross-organizational patient pathways and customer pathways, so integrated care pathways, both health and social, and clinical decision support. So it's, it's really something that the clinicians really love. And, um, it's, it's very important that we have like generic frameworks. And I think open air, GDL, uh, task planning, the different specifications that we have in this open air space, um, they, they take us one step closer. And, and when we can use these generic tools for different uh, um, use cases, then it is um, say a lot um, faster to, to develop these um, decision support um, applications, for example, for different use cases. So, so we, we need to have like a factory, <laughs> you know, and, and generic tools. And, and then we also need to have models that we can reuse, not only the clinical models, but also the business rule models, like uh, somebody here, maybe it was Ian who mentioned it. And then the, the um, model processes and bits and pieces process that we can reuse again and again. Okay. Uh, basically, let me let me ask this question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, were, were there any other uh, of you want that wanted to comment, Dr. Ahmed? Yes. Uh, yeah, in addition to what my colleagues mentioned about the clinical decision support system, sometimes we would like to, to deal with the patient's data to generate sort of uh, a notification, health notification, uh, I mean, some, uh, some patients build on, on, uh, on his current condition as a personalized education or personalized notification, like reminders to do, like a mammal screening reminders, or, or notification that, for example, due to the weather, 
your son have a bronchial asthma, you need to uh, avoid going to the school. Building these things, it requires our DMRs to have a clinical data that's enough to support such a things. It's not only the clinical decision, also we will look at the tactical level, the strategic level of, of, of the analytics and the decision support. Some of the data we are not exchanging actually currently for the clinical, uh, for the patient file, but we will need it at a strategic level, at the regional level, uh, tactical or at the national level uh, as a strategic. So collecting some of these data is sometimes important will be uh, directly. And to be able to do that, it requires a real uh, rich uh, 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 data model uh, similar to what we have in the archetypes built through open air. Thank uh, you. I would, to add one, one interesting observation that I had. So when, when thinking about clinical decision support at this stage, we should think about, you know, when you go bowling with your children and you put these guardrails on the sides of the bowling path so that the ball cannot fall off. I think that's the, the most important role of AI at the moment to, to, to make sure that we don't make some huge mistakes because of, uh, you know, uh, people make mistakes. So this, these guardrails, I think, are a good way to think about AI at the moment. Okay, that's a nice analogy. So uh, let, me, let me ask you this uh, uh, other question. You know the clinical data repository. You know if we so if we reach an uh, an open you know like the best uh, future case scenario that we have. My question to you is, you know, you could imagine that every country has this big bubble that is the the open air the 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 the, the, the data repository. Now, what about the 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 what what's going to happen with with data? Uh, between countries, uh, so so if I'm if I'm in a country A and I'm you know so so we've reached a situation where you know at a national level we managed to do a very good job of having you know this level of of, of uh, clinical data repository. Uh, now, how do you see the uh, uh, you know the the, the relationship uh, of health data uh, across borders? Are we going to have uh, an information health exchange at that level? You know, uh, I, I, to me, I, I always believe that we have to be centered around individuals. You know, so I don't even call it patient-centered. I call it person-centered. And the person travels from one city to another, from one country to another. So how can, how can we reconcile, you know, the sovereignty of, of, of countries uh, but also, uh, you know, continue to push for the uh, openness and the liquidity of, 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 of data. Dr. Ahmed? And again, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through all of you with this question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, what's happening in, in Europe, they, they try to do a sort of a summary exchange um, based on uh, some complex credentials so that the physician could access the patient summary in different countries. And uh, what's pushing now is the, the globalization of the clinical service where we do have uh, this, the telemedicine services or the teleconsultation services. Everybody is consulting physician in different areas worldwide. That will require the data to be, uh, to be exchanged in, 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 the, in, the, in the best way rather than placing it in an email or Dropbox or so on. And on the other hand, the, the two things that are uh, affecting the use of uh, open air in here is, is this, this part, which is the need of inform uh, patient information exchange across the borders. Also, uh, we need to exchange the knowledge, the algorithm that the advanced countries uh, build uh, using the AI. So uh, if, if, if that algorithm is built somewhere, and other countries would like to reuse it, they will not be able to use it with the same uh, um, uh, uh, reliability if they don't have the number of data sets that are used or data points that are used in the other country. So uh, using open air will unify, first of all, uh, at the same time will help countries to understand what data points they, they need to aggregate at the point of, of care in the hospitals or any uh, encounters. 
So these two things will enforce us toward being able to exchange this knowledge in the algorithm buildings, as well as the, the exchanging the patient uh, summaries in, in, in a structured or semantic way that can be reused in the other side. Thank you. Uh, any other one uh, that wants to comment? Hi. Uh, here in, in Spain, we are in, in Catalonia, it's a northern east region in, in Spain, but we have a 19 uh, regional health service and all health services speak with different, uh, with different models and we have problems to the interoperability between these regions and we think that the, the user standards like Hope NHR, like mm -hmm. the interoperability interoperability with us it was advantage for us to communicate to, to maintain the meaning of the of the information now we only have a a, a little summary of uh, electronic health record for all spain is a little summary but uh, isn't the whole data that we we could uh, share with us if we use this kind of standards okay thank you uh any any other comments? Yeah, so we were sorry, we were part of uh, the EPSOS project, so I, I I fully felt the pain of actually it wasn't really a technical issue in the end. It was a lot of other issues from reimbursement to translations to uh, to uh, consents uh, uh, to actually talking about the same things, meaning terminology. So there was a lot of work being done, uh, a lot of good work. Uh, again, I think the technical part was actually the easiest. It's all the other issues that are much, much more difficult. And uh, of course, th that needs to be taken care of. But I would think that, uh, you know, countries should really fix their situ situation first because uh, that's their, their people. Uh, of course, some people move around, but the majority of people stay in the country, which means that, you know, it, that should be the priority. Now, hopefully they do similar things so that later on they can connect. But I'm seeing a lot of emphasis, you know, I saw countries that were doing EPSOS and didn't have it solved inside their country, which is kind of strange, strange to me. Okay, th thank you. Uh, Osama and then Hannah. I just say, what to add one point that I think if there is an area which open air can see its muscle and can really get the interest of a lot of countries would be public health uh, use cases, especially with, uh, with regard to COVID, mm -hmm. Vaccination. And I think building models around it will be will be a great uh, opportunity for open air. And I, I believe that many countries will jump in, into it because there is a gap and everybody needs it. Yeah. Thank you. Cross border. Uh, open air based uh, data exchange. So, for example, euro transplant for organ organ um, um, donors. And also between Italy and Slovenia, as Thomas knows very well. So, so some uh, cross border activities. Ian? Uh, yeah, I, I agree about the public health aspect. So we, we, I was privileged to, to be involved in some very exciting uh, global activity around the start of COVID, although it was sad circumstances. But very recently, I've actually been working with Paul's colleagues in, in Catalonia to develop some, actually to redevelop some vaccination models that were originally developed in Scotland with based on some international standards fully lined up with the international patient summary, which is what EPSOS is now. Uh, but also we've added in, <coughs> excuse me, the WHO vaccine certificate um, data standards. So I, I think it's a really great opportunity. Now that we, we can, ha we have that running already on, on an open air data store. We can query it, we can send it via fire. We can do all these things. So it, we can do this stuff really fast. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a huge complex project. Um, you know, vaccine certification is definitely a very interesting area, as well as all the other public health issues. Our, our Chinese colleagues did some very interesting work based on their very early experience in, in that country and made that all available open source. 
Thank you very much. So, so, so we have time for for the last live uh, poll. If you put, if you can put the live uh, poll, uh, and then we'll we'll have the the final uh, messages. Right. So, so the control the control room. Can can you put the final uh, uh, questionnaire? So, from your perspective, what would be the best feature to describe open air? So, uh, the last question for the audience. From your perspective, what could be the best feature to describe open air? So far, we only have one answer, 100%, uh, talking about interoperability. Yeah. Can can answer? It's uh, uh, no. We're we're asking uh, we're asking the audience, okay. and then we can we can we can we'll have a final uh, you know message from each one of you. So let's give it another uh, ten seconds. So far, everyone is stuck with uh, interoperability. Okay, so we have 100% for interoperability. That's uh, that's that's uh, uh, amazing. So uh, let uh, let me just uh, ask you for a final thought on on open air. Uh, you know, maybe every one of you, if you could just give us like a 30 seconds uh, answer. Uh, so let's start with Hannah. Uh, she's muted. Okay, could you please repeat the question? So, so a final, a final thought, basically. Ah, okay, the fine, from, from fine, fine. In, in thirty seconds. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> open air is growing in in popularity, but I think it's very, very important that um, uh, in order to be successful, we need to build awareness, so increase awareness, and it has to be happen among all stakeholders. And in, in order to get the buy-in for open air, we need to be able to discuss open air and the benefits of open air in an easy and understandable way. Otherwise, we can't get the decision makers along. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Ahmed. You're on. You're on mute. You're good now. Okay. Now, yeah, I uh, I believe open air can be used at the national level in a good manner if it's uh, really used in some of the national uh, uh, um, I mean, custodians like WHO in some of their national uh, programs as as the the uh, the. Uh, the data uh, models. Uh, also, I believe we need my, ourselves, I mean, to, to learn from the countries who have a real successful stories in pushing the market on their side to utilize this, uh, uh, this uh, standards. And I believe by times it's really a community based that uh, the companies uh, and with the new, with the movement in technology in the mobile applications and AI, the gr gradually all the, uh, or most of the EMR uh, um, providers or uh, designers will will move into an open air. Thank you very much. So uh, let me go to uh, to uh, Paul Paul Perez. Hi. Yes. You yes. you listen? Ah, okay. Well, uh, I think that it's. it's all the audience uh, say the same, no? The interoperability is, is the, the, the biggest skills. But maybe it's, I think that is the, is the problem that every, everybody can to solve, no? Or have to solve to, to interconnect different uh, hospital information systems. But uh, uh, maybe in a, in a future, uh, the, the important thing is on the interoperability. Isn't the the database are only everybody works to the same system? 
I think so. Because interoperability is, is a solution, but it's a, is a, a, a short solution or a short term. But the, when you want or, or you think in a, a long time, I think that it's better to work to the same system or a same uh, database model. Thank you. Uh, so I'll yeah. go to Sam. So if I can just uh, continue here, uh, I think that's uh, uh, completely right. So at OpenEHR, we're actually discussing that we want to eliminate the need for interoperability using OpenEHR. Because if people already speak to the same models, interoperability is built in. There is no need for that. Of course, the legacy has to be migrated and, and connected. But what uh, I would say in 30 seconds is uh, open air is about what we call data for life. So we're, we're talking about longitudinal records from cradle to grave. And I think this is the strong point. And if you think about AI and all these things, how we're going to use data, we actually need to know as much as we can about the patient. And this comes from a record that is built for life. So that's, that's I think, uh, the main, the main uh, issue we're trying to solve. Thank you very much. So I'll go to Osama and then uh, last, uh, Ian. So Osama. So I have very quick messages. So data for life is a very, very tough course. It will take ages to happen. We need to have more tactical uh, approaches to, to, to at least improve the situation. So I think for open air as an organization, they need to be more representative. They need to include the region as part of their team, as part of their decision support on how to include new architects and new templates. So I think this is one thing for open air. Uh, for companies like uh, Better or Maran previously, they need to have more courage to come to the region to, to partner with SMEs to, uh, to develop uh, use cases or POCs, they need to be more, more pushy on that part. I think the government, yes, even if they want to have open air, they need also to see experts coming to the region and interacting with them, taking the one step ahead. Uh, I think also for open air, maybe it could be a good opportunity to partner also with AHIMA because training, the learning curve of open air is not that easy. We, are, we have to push clinician to be part of the journey. And this is not really easy. You need to have some sort of structured training. And I think AIMA maybe could be the best organization in this place where we can, you put, can have certification programs, career path, something like that, that can people feel that they, they, they will be secure when they start this journey with Open Air. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, give the last word. You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, not much else to say other than, yeah, I think the future is about patient-centric and coherent data stores separate from the apps. It is a post-interoperability solution. It says, look, we've got to live with interoperability right now. It's legacy. It's where we are. But it's not, it's not where we want to be. We won't get those coherent, patient-centric, longitudinal pathways that we all want, both as, as citizens and, and clinicians. So whether you believe the whole story about open air or not, the ideas in there, I believe, are where we will be in the future. Thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to thank uh, all my, you know, the lovely uh, panelists, uh, uh, Hannah, uh, Paul, uh, Ahmed, uh, Ian, Sama, and uh, Thomas. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, our lovely audience, for uh, you know putting questions, being interested, you know, participating in the live poll, and of course, you know, I want to thank uh, Ahima for uh, actually bringing this very important topic to the to the region, and I'll take the opportunity now to hand it over back to the host, uh, Ms. Christina Rosen. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, all so much. Uh, don't go away quite yet. Um, so let me just say that I've really, really sincerely enjoyed uh, this round table. Uh, I feel now I can uh, not call myself an open air expert whatsoever, but I certainly increased a lot of my knowledge in this space and, I, and a lot of things were clarified. I think the whole thing with fire versus the open air standards uh, that was really, really helpful for me and I think uh, hopefully others for also for others to have clarify, clarification on. Um, so I think some of the takeaways here, I think that was um, 
you know, really important is that I think at the end of the day, whether we're a vendor, a regulator, a hospital, a clinician, uh, we all want to have this open data access. And I think that was very clear in the poll where it came across, you know, the number one thing here is it's really the interoperability. And as I sort of started out the speech, I was saying, you know, it's all the years that I've been in this sector, which is becoming a long time, we talk about interoperability. How are we going to solve interoperability? Um, and I just really feel that we have something here uh, that's, that, you know, can really be a game changer, a much needed game changer. Um, what I was interested in asking as a final, final question, but I don't think we have any more time. So perhaps, uh, Dr. Al Hasawi, this goes to your blog. But that is that it feels like it's sort of, uh, there's an open air revolution that sort of needs to happen. And it feels like that has happened with different entities in different places. Um, I thought, Thomas, it was interesting that you were talking about this sort of vendor coalition uh, so that the vendor is not like the evil ones here necessarily uh, blocking this. Um, and then uh, uh, clearly in Catalonia, uh, where you know you have to remove maybe 27 systems, clearly there, there are gonna be some vendors that won't be perhaps too happy about that. How do you manage this? And But it's sort of like there, the revolution is happening from the, uh, from the government side, perhaps. And then there were some examples of some clinicians uh, who felt, you know, something here needs to change. So I'm just really, curious to see like does it you know does this change require sort of a coalition because i thought the it seemed like the answers are quite different depending also on the different um regions and being scandinavian myself it was interesting to hear hannah's uh explanation of you know this culture of trust and so on in uh, in scandinavia and how perhaps that can really be a sort of a, a fire starter um so yeah, so, so Ahima will definitely um, move into this space much more. We're going to be uh, talking again about this topic at our upcoming Ahima Middle East conference uh, on the 24th and 25th of March. Hope to see many of you there. And to Dr. Osama's point, so yes, absolutely. Uh, Ahima is in here for supporting anyone who uh, wants to learn more about it and maybe eventually working also on some more uh, trainings in that field much needed. And on that point, I wanted to mention that Hannah has some amazing uh, training products already uh, that have been on, on the market for a long time. Uh, really, really great stuff there. So you should check that out um, if you want to learn more right now. So yeah, I think that's it from my point. So I just wanted to give a huge thank again to uh, to all of you for taking this time uh, to educate me and everyone else out there and look forward to connecting with all of you again hopefully in the, in real time somewhere um, and to everyone who joins stay safe uh, and looking forward to connecting with you again on webinars and LinkedIn and, and eventually face to face so Thank you so much you. and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.